for those of you who don't know, Dr. Lucille Eber, it's my honor to introduce her. Lucille has been at this work at the table on PBS since the very beginning. She's a fierce advocate for supporting students, especially the most vulnerable and their families. And in that pursuit, she will ask you questions, very intentional questions, probably pointing her finger at you, like this, and she's gonna say, are your interventions evidence-based? Are they being implemented with fidelity? Do you have data showing outcomes for youth and their families? Can you scale this to support more efficiently and effectively? Lucille has been asking these questions for 25 years and has held her colleagues to those standards ever since. Ever passionate about being more effective with limited resources, Lucille began advancing the idea of interconnecting school and community systems into a single continuum, what we're calling now the Interconnected Systems Framework. Lucille is a dear friend and mentor, and if you've ever met her, had the opportunity to have her laugh with you, hug you, point her finger at you, tell you to do better, all at the same meal, at the same time, then you know she's a friend of yours too. Here's the most passionate advocate for PBIS I've ever known, youth and their families, Lucille. And you're on time. I'm on, right? Good morning. Thank you, Brian. He's perfect, isn't he? And he was right on time. His timing was perfect. Don't be so nervous. You're good. It's my pleasure to be here. Usually I'm doing what Brian did for those who were here before, but somehow I got roped into doing the harder job today. So let's do it. How y'all doing? Everybody good? Welcome to Chicago. All right. So you can see the title of our presentation this morning, Silver Linings, A Pathway to a Healthy Future. And I really, I was very excited when I saw Valerie Williams' welcome speech because I want to thank her for her, her kernels on connectiveness and a view of mental health as overall wellness. And she talked about transforming systems. I thought she could just do the keynote, Renee. She like covered all the important concepts. So I'm very appreciative of her warm welcome and her wisdom. So Mito and Renee, please let her know that for me. You know, silver lining is a metaphor for optimism and we need optimism. And it's also about thinking about the advantages that come with hardships, that come with difficulties. And we all have that. I do have a subtitle for this presentation today, and it's PBIS 2.0, The Story. Now, some people are gonna want me to break into a Brandy Carlisle song right here, you know. All of these lines across my face tell you the story of who I am. But anyway, that's for you, Brian, because Brian said he wanted a story today. So we're gonna do PBIS 2.0, The Story, okay? Little acknowledgments and gratitude first, a lot of acknowledgments and gratitudes first. There's been so many people I've roped into getting up on this stage over the past 20 years, you know, and we've had, so our co-directors from the inception who are now happily just senior advisors and not here today. Together, George and Rob were up here on opening day over 10 times in the past 20 years. So, you know, there, there's a job that has to be done here. We've had the famous Catherine Bradshaw. Is she here yet? I know she's on her way. She's actually going to be here. Who's responsible for a lot of the research on, on PBIS. And we've had Hill Walker. We've had Richard Milner here on day two. We've had Andy Garbaz and Andrea Davis talk about families. We've had Tom Deshawn, who we all miss greatly. Once we had an eighth grader from Michigan, Scott Alfie. You guys remember him? I'm not sure where he is today, but he was pretty good. So I'm really grateful to be here. Last year, we had somebody we all love. Remember Rhonda up here last year? You know? Rhonda, you know what I say? The song that goes in my head with that one? And they don't dance like Rhonda no more. Remember when she danced for us? She was great, but Rhonda helped me out get ready for this keynote today because she was day two, and she said, you know, when you're day two, you don't have to teach anything. Rob Horner told me that's the day one presenter that has to do that. Remember when she said that last year? So as I was getting ready, I was thinking, ah, oh, Rhonda, you know. So I, I 
I will come back to that in a moment. Some other specific acknowledgments of people who actually helped me put this together, because those of you that know me know, you know, I'm not that great with the technology. I can't remember the dates of stuff. I was texting Jen Freeman yesterday, what date was the TFI point two point oh? And she said, I don't know, ask Kent, you know? But a lot of people have helped me, but in particular, I, I really want to thank Jennifer Norton from the Midwest team because her artistic abilities, you know her as the evaluation people. When we hired her, she was an art teacher. But anyway, Jennifer, thank you for all your help. And Bob Putnam, he is like one of the jewels, uns, unsung heroes of PBIS. He gave me some great data and a great story today, so thank you, Bob, for that. And Kelly Perales is responsible for a lot of help, but she came up with the title. Silver lining's pretty good, huh, you know? And when she came up with that, I said, you can go home, your work is over for the day, you know? That's really good. And of course, Brian helps me with everything, but basically he said, I want a story. So, you know, I already sang you a song, Brian, and told you a story, so hopefully you're happy. And then there's Susan Barrett. I don't know if you guys know, but they call us Sue Seal, all right? So let me say no more, because Susan Barrett is all over this presentation with me. So thank you, you guys, for your particular help. And let's talk about what Rhonda taught me, okay? What Rhonda taught me about what the first day is, oh wait, I already knew what it was supposed to be, but she helped me learn it, right? And uh, what, she, what she reminded me is I have to teach something, so right? So first thing I'm gonna teach you is fidelity. Don't train anybody unless you're checking to see if it works. What does fidelity mean? It means are you doing it the way you're supposed to? So I have a fidelity check for my keynote this morning. So I'm gonna put some points up here and you can pick one or two. If you have really good brain power and weren't in the bar too late last night, you might pick three, okay? But remember, never more than three, right? Don't focus on more than three things at one time, you're gonna get lost. But I'm supposed to connect with the newbies and I see there's a lot of you. Let me see those hands again. Who's your first time here? Oh man, this is gonna be hard. And the long-termers who's been here for 10 or more PBIS forms? Yeah, they're all gathered up in the front. How about five or more PBIS forms? Good job. How many were here last year? Oh, look at that, that's a lot, okay. So we have a lot of different people. I'm gonna be sharing tools and publications from the center. I'm gonna hopefully help you be able to establish your rationale to stick the course with PBIS and multi-tiered systems. Teach a few basics with some examples and talk about our continuous improvement. But you know, Valerie Williams, she nailed it for me. We gotta demystify mental health. Mental health is what we do, all of you, in schools every day. Don't be saying I don't do mental health, because if you say you don't do mental health, you shouldn't be working with kids, right? Every one of you are capable of doing mental health. And of course, a little bit of vision of, of what's to come. And any other thing you wanna evaluate me on, Go ahead, but you know, I'm watching those evaluations, okay? All right, just kidding. But let's start with a little celebration, right? We've had this center for 25 years and it just got funded for five more, right? And there, yeah, how about that? I mean, that almost calls for another song. Let's say we'll go to Three Dog Night here. Celebrate, celebrate, right? Dance to the data, because it's the data, right? It's the data that got the success. We didn't just do it. So thank you to Kent McIntosh and Jennifer Norton and the Midwest team for compiling the number of schools that were trained by the PBIS Center or its affiliated state networks, have active PBIS leadership teams, and have an active current plan for uh, uh, submitting data and, and monitoring their implementation. That's a lot of schools, right? And you know, during the pandemic and afterward, people weren't into submitting data, people weren't into, they were into survival, and we're still into a little bit of survival, but the numbers of people go back up. But I gotta tell you, there's thousands, thousands, thousands more schools that aren't even in our database who are using this work. So, you know, it, 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 it's a pretty big deal and you're part of a pretty big thing. And what's different after 25 years, you know? Well, first of all, what's the same? You see these questions up here? And Brian kind of did a, a few of them. But Rob Horner taught me these questions in 1998. You don't just train people. You got to check to see if they're actually doing it. And if they do it, are they doing it right, the way you're supposed to, the way research tells you you're going to get an effect on that? And if you're, if you're doing something, do the kids benefit? And do our most marginalized kids actually benefit? 
And the answer to that last question 25 years later, we know the answer is yes. We have the data. You all are on the right path for helping our most marginalized kids. So fidelity matters, as I mentioned, and here's the latest fidelity measures. It's going back up again. We're so grateful to all of you who share your data because that helps us in terms of the center be able to reach out more and connect with more people. So fidelity really matters, and it's really the um, number of unique schools submitting scores from at least one validated center on PBIS fidelity tool. That's how you get into this database in case you want to be part of it. And of course, following the questions, impact matters. Take a look at this data. I mean, this is, what does Rob Horner say, Susan? Heck of a deal, right? Remember when Rob Horner stands up here and he shows the slide, he says, that's a heck of a deal for a small investment, right? The improved student outcomes just keep continuing. The reduction in exclusionary discipline, you know, exclusionary discipline is a lifelong negative impact on kids. Have you heard of the school to prison pipeline? We've been talking about that for decades. So reducing exclusionary discipline is critically important and improving the, the health of our staff, our teachers, our people who work in the schools. So listed under there, for all you research geeks out there, are numerous studies that you can look up, and there's even more. There's been random control trial studies published since 2006, and the center only started in 1998. Rob's right. You know, that's a pretty fast heck of a deal. Wouldn't you say, Renee? That, I mean, that, that, that's worth refunding for another five years, up to 30 years, isn't it? Oh, where's my high school people? Where are you? Does it work in high schools? <laughs> okay, the answer is yes. Quit saying that. We got gotcha. you. We got you covered. There's lots of high school stuff here. It does work in high schools. And now this is the beginning of when the little icon's going to show up at the bottom of the slide. That's the session. So if you're not going to a research session, but you want to know about the MTSSB study, that's the session you go find the materials on later. Okay, so the, I'm gonna have this, this PowerPoint's already posted, by the way, thank you. Doesn't always happen with the keynotes, you know, but it's up there for you. But the, I was proud to be part of this MTSSB study. Sherry, it was hard. Wasn't it hard? But the impacts, one of the things that came out of that study is how important tier one is for our most vulnerable kids. It used to be special ed was what we hoped would work for our vulnerable kids. No, it's special ed techniques embedded inside everybody's classroom that helps our kids with disabilities, right? So this study is really important, and thank you, Kenton, uh, for the, the takeaways on this slide. So, so let's, let's go backwards a little bit before we go forwards, right? It's really important that we stick to what works, we stick to the basics, we stick to the things that have produced results, and we think back on where we came from. We don't want to get caught or lost in the current noise. We want to keep our perspective, and we want to move forward grounded in what we know already works. But there's contextual changes to how we do this work, and that's really important as well. So we're going to go into the way back machine. I did not put my slide in with you know, Mr. Peabody, but um, we're going into the Wayback Machine. So the 70s. I mean, what were some of us thinking about? Yes, I was in a basement classroom in the 70s. I was a child prodigy. Uh, Justin, she, did you hear what he said? He said she was 12. Just, uh, Justin knows because we've been through this before. But so, some of us back in the 70s with behavior science, we were using it in the basement. And what we were thinking about is, are we ever going to get out of the basement? It was, it was, you know, that you knew that you were doing a good job with who you had, but you knew when they went out on the playground, it, maybe it wasn't going to transfer out there, right? So around behavioral science, we started thinking about there's something more going on with this kid. Where are the mental health people, right? And some of us started trying to think about how to bring mental health supports in schools, right? When we moved, did I go too fast here? There we go. When we got to the 80s, remember the word mainstreaming, right? 
We've had, we've had so much language in so many words that we use to describe things, but we were talking about if kids have behavior needs, can we get them into a general education classroom? And again, in the 80s, I was actually in the Florida system in the 80s, and we were talking about um, uh, what were, SEDNET. And remember SEDNET? Where's the Florida people? I wrote one of the first SEDNET grants in Palm Beach County, and that was back in probably 1981 where we were talking about how do we get mental health supports inside our classrooms and with our teachers. And that moved us into the 90s, and Brian mentioned this in his opening, where, remember, interagency system of care language, right? And that's when I first learned wraparound as a technique to build supports around kids and families in natural environments and get them into their communities out of residential treatment and get them successful in second grade classrooms instead of down in the basement. But there's still a lot of silos, right? And unfortunately, we still struggle with silos today. But if you think back, what do they say? We've come a long way, baby, right? I mean, I know we have a long way to go and I know there's a lot of work to do, but I tell you what we were thinking about back then was different. I first listened to George and Rob talk about prevention and intervention sooner and doing school-wide stuff in the, I'm thinking the mid-90s. And it was at a special ed behavior conference. And I remember thinking to myself, what the heck have I been doing all these years? This makes so much more sense. Take the knowledge and technology that we use in the basement and bring it upstairs into the hallway, into the classrooms, and teach everybody how to have active supervision, how to greet and nurture with their contact with a kid when they walk in the door in the morning, how to use five to one. Now, Bob tells me it's nine to one. Nine to one, Bob Putnam says. Nine to one positives for every error correction. We, we did that. And now George and Rob were saying, stop doing it one kid at a time. And in 1998, I got the year right, in 1998, the center was funded. Of course, people like me were going, this is great, but can we get wraparound in there? Can we get system of care in there? Can we get families in there? And what was cool about the center, it was they were open. Rob and George were like, well, tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? And it's been quite a journey from 1998 to now. All right, the triangle. Who knows the triangle? All right. Wait a minute. I better see more hands than that. Who knows the triangle? Oh, thank you. Thank you, God. OK. All right. So when we first looked at school-wide processes and school-wide supports, what we learned was take the technology, the behavior technology, the effective practices, and put them everywhere. It's not that simple because a lot of the people in the schools are going, are you kidding me? I'm going to use five to one? Who, who's counting, right, you know? I'm going to greet everybody personally at the door in the morning, but you know, people got the hang of it, people learned it, and once it was school-wide, the next thing is some kids need more, right? And this is a medical model, right? If you think about, uh, uh, Steve Romano used to hate it when I did this, but smoking, you want, you want everybody to know the dangers of smoking, right? And then some people need to go to a class and learn more about the dangers of smoking to convince them to do it. And some people actually have lung problems and need, on top of that, need some medication and some clinical intervention. We're, do, we're doing the same medical model as what Rob and George taught us in schools. So everybody gets positive behavior supports. Some get a higher dosage, and some get a highly individualized extra dosage on top. You know, we call it primary prevention, we call it secondary prevention, and we call it tertiary prevention. And by the way, this, in 1998, was the very first application of what we now call MTSS. It started with behavior, and because it works so well, and maybe because we were good at getting people to use our language, it kind of picked up and moved. And uh, this is not Bill Gates. <laughs> Rob told me once, this is Rob Horner, who taught me this in 1998. Rob told me once he was on a plane and somebody came up to him and said, I know who you are. <laughs> and he's like, 
Yeah, because he kind of dressed like Bill Gates, right? Always the blue suit coat, but this, Rob Horner taught us that in 1998, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't show our other founding center director. Now look down at the bottom of that slide there. It says, in 2015, almost 20 years after the initiation of school-wide PBIS, the term MTSS for literary was called for at the U.S. Department of Education in the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, I can't say the whole thing, blah, 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 act, okay? But, you know, it, it, because this work was so successful, the school-wide positive behavior approach, it's had a significant impact on the things the U.S. Department of Education does to this day. That's pretty amazing. And those of you that have been part of this work for a long time, you should be proud. And those of you that are doing this work now, you should feel confident. And you should feel competent that you're getting the right resources and support because this is the foundation work. And here's the basic core features of PBIS, right? It's not just the practices, it's the systems. We don't say it's the system stupid, but you know. It's like, come on, think about it. It's how you organize the adults, as George said. It's not how you organize the kids, a little bit. It's mostly about how you organize the adults. We put the right people in teams, get the right data in front of them, teach them how to ask the right questions about the data, and then select the practices that do it. When I first learned it, it was stuff like, let's see, we have a high rate of office discipline referrals on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 11 and 12. What happens then? Playground volleyball games we, or, or kickball games or something, we need to teach them different ways to do it. Not take away kickball. That's not the answer, right? So that was the basics, and that's still with us. You have teams that are involved in it. You look at the data. You make decisions. Screening is a critical part of the system. We have lots of sessions and information on screening on our web page. We got to find the kids earlier and get the prevention in place earlier. How many of you have screening systems going on in your district today? Not bad, needs to be more. How many of you screen for anxiety and depression as well as acting out behavior? Thank you for raising your hands on that one too. That's a bit of our mental health integration. And of course, the data monitoring for fidelity and effectiveness, the ongoing coaching. People don't change their techniques and their interactions with kids just by going to one training. You gotta practice and you gotta have somebody there who's going, good for you. Oh, I took this data on how you were doing it in the classroom and I saw you had, if you're in Bob Putnam's group, I saw you had an eight to one correction to positives and we want you to have a nine to one. Oh my God, are you kidding me, Bob, right? But you know that the coaching piece is critical. So here's the question. I learned about these features 25 years ago. Do we still think about and operationalize these the same 25 years later? They're the same features, they're strong. There's just some additional and different context we're gonna talk about in a minute. But we're still walking through the, the years here, right? This is where around 2000, early, mid 2000s, we started talking about schools can't do this alone. It's too overwhelming. There's too much going on. There's too much mental health crisis. What are we gonna do? Some of us who had worked in the system of care side and then worked in the education side, and you know, Eric Bruns, I'm sorry to say this, but system of care didn't quite make the change in schools that we needed because it was focused on such a small segment of the population. But the knowledge of wraparound and community and family voice and youth voice, that impact came right out of the early system of care work and is embedded now into our interconnected system framework and mental health being embedded in PBIS. And, and that work started over 10 years ago. So I want you to know it's been a long time coming. And for some of you that came into this work just now, you're probably going, well, of course we screen for anxiety and depression. Why wouldn't we? And to that, I say music to my ears, because it wasn't always that way. We have come a long way, baby. We have a long way to go, but we've come a long way. Because now we have interventions for coping and anxiety built right into the tier one matrix, right? Are you teaching coping skills as part of tier one? Who's teaching coping skills as part of tier one? It's happening, isn't it? 
25 years ago, teachers were uncomfortable with teaching coping skills overall, unless they were a special ed teacher or a social worker. We have begun to transform how school climates work. It's, it's really very exciting. And I'm only up to 2014. So we got 10 years to go. Don't worry, I'm going fast here. Okay, so interconnecting school mental health and PBIS is a process that we started around that time. And you can't just invite the community providers to come into your school. You've got to change the way you work so different people can bring their expertise at the table and have an impact. There's role changes, all kinds of uh, structure changes that have to happen. Uh, we put out the uh, Advancing Educational Effectiveness, it's a long title, Interconnecting School Mental Health and School-Wide Positive Behavior Supports in 2013. That's 10 years ago, Susan. 10 years ago, right? And we have a volume two that tells you actually how to uh, script the moves to bring people together. So, you know, don't set up separate systems. Don't make more silos. We have to have one connected system. And in that one connected system, what we need to have is everybody through one set of teams. We don't want the mental health people meeting over here and the PBIS people meeting over there. That makes no sense. They're actually the same people, most of them, and, if, and they need to be on one team. So that's what the, when we talk about interconnecting your system framework. And you know, back in the day for mental health, if you got a mental health grant, you know what the required evaluation was? How many kids saw somebody? Are you kidding me? That's not good enough. Do we measure reading outcomes by how many kids showed up for reading class? Then why would we measure mental health outcomes by how many kids saw a mental health clinician? That is not enough. The kids and the families deserve just as much rigor and evaluation around the mental health interventions as around reading interventions and as around acting out behavior interventions that change. So thank you. So, the, 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 my favorite message from ISF, and Susan's been trying to get me to say it more positively for years, but I put it up here, access is not enough. You know how we try to never say not in our expectations? But I can't stop saying that. Access is not enough. We gotta make sure it's working with rigor and use the framework to measure those interventions. So if you're not connect, or familiar with the interconnected system framework, there's plenty of resources on the web page. But remember, it's not a new initiative. It's not a different initiative. It's not a new framework. It's an expansion of the PBIS framework, bringing different people and knowledge into the room. Please don't call it a separate system, or it's actually counter to what we're trying to achieve by bringing different people to the table. No silos, we're all about alignment. And we've been about alignment a long time. And you know, we wanna better align the initiatives through one set of teams. And we, I wanna just quick tell you about some resources for the interest of time. And to meet that fidelity check about center resources, anybody monitoring that one? Okay, this counts. So one of my favorite guides that we wrote is the interconnecting of trauma-informed approaches within a PBIS framework. And a lot of the researchers, not in our field, but in the school mental health field, we're writing about, and they're quoted in here as saying, we don't know if it's working because we're not measuring it. We're training people in trauma-informed, but we have no idea. But if you embed it in a framework that's filled with evaluations and fidelity checks, you're going to know if it's working or not. So this is one of my favorite resources, along with this one that took us way too many years to get out, but we did it, and it came out in uh, 2020. Maybe, okay? And this is our ISF volume two, where we actually script the moves chapter by chapter about how to transform your system with community and family right on the same teams as teachers and principals. And you know, and the good news about all of that, bringing mental health into it, is, you know, and again, mental health is in your area of expertise if you work with kids, right? That's just, it's teaching. What is the most evidence-based mental health intervention for young kids? It's cognitive behavioral therapy. What is cognitive behavioral therapy? It's instruction about new ways of functioning in situations, you know? I mean, we just need to break it down. We are teaching. 
You know how to teach. You define it, you model it, you practice it, you correct it. We can do that for how to manage self-injurious behaviors the same way we can to do how to raise your hand. So we, we know we're, we're breaking down the silos, we're breaking down the barriers, and we're moving forward. And it all comes from our history. Don't go backwards into silos. Move forward into expanded systems, right? So what are we thinking about now? This is a, a little hard, especially after yesterday's events in Maine as a, a key reminder. But I need to tell you that the, um, the center has been very, very active in helping schools and communities with recovery and with crisis, and we have lots of resources. We have a team of people sitting right in this room who've been going from city to city and state to state. And thank you to my team members who've been doing that work. I personally have not, but I, we have a, a lot of resources on there. And it's a major role of the center, even though it doesn't look like it on paper. It's a major role because it's hard work and it needs to be done and people need to bring them knowledge. You know, when I was in wraparound, um, Eric, you'll remember this, what's the definition of a crisis in wraparound? When the adults don't know what to do. So it's really important in times of crisis that somebody shows up on the phone, the Zoom, and in person and helps you figure out what to do. And that's an important role of the center and I'm very proud of my colleagues who do this hard work and it's a very important work. You know, let's talk about national trends for a moment and our current context for doing PBIS, right? So our current context for doing PBIS is really, uh, it's exacerbated of what we already knew. Let me explain. We've had a mental health crisis with our youth for over 20 years that we've been aware of. We have been under-identifying kids who need behavior support, even in special education, since I went to college in the 70s when I was 12. You know? I mean, the other, uh, I learned about the under-identification in my undergraduate classes in the 70s. Uh, Nancy, what was that course? Uh, pathology in Children. We met in that course in the 1970s. And we learned about the under-identification and the lack of appropriate treatments. So this is not new. The awareness, and here's the silver lining, thank you Kelly Perales for that. The silver lining is about all that's been going on is everybody's aware. Everybody talks mental health. It's everywhere in the media. It's everywhere in conversations and communities, and it needs to be, right? But this has been going on for a long time. Uh, for example, the recognition that racism is an adverse childhood experiences with m major long-term health consequences, that's not new. That's not new since 2020, right? But things, people are becoming more aware. Staff shortages, sorry, that was before the pandemic, right? And experiencing getting people in the right spaces, right? Uh, this report's from 2017. How are the teachers doing? The concern that educators experience significantly more stress. 61% of educators reported their work is always or often stressful, right? One of my sisters is here. She taught first grade for 40 years. And she's, she was 12 also when she started. <laughs> it's a stressful job, right? One of my grandmothers was a teacher until she got married and they wouldn't let her teach anymore. I, I, I really, it was 12 when I started, okay? But you, you know, the things that have been going on in schools are, um, you know, exacerbated and we're more aware of them, but they're not new. The crisis that we're facing with children of color disproportionately exposed to trauma and less likely to have access to mental health services, we're more aware of it now. It's possibly getting worse, but it's been going on for a while. So we need to celebrate our new partners at the table who want to work with us to try to change the impact of some of these, right? You know, people who are living in lower, lower uh, income communities and urban and rural areas are disproportionately exposed to trauma and less likely to have access to mental health services. The rate of bullying among our LGBTQ population has always been off the charts. And it's more off the charts but more people are aware of it and hopefully we're acting 
more aggressively to take care of that or to try to change that. So in the current context, this is what you're going to hear about. The little kids are getting kicked out in droves. That's happening. That's happening. It's happened before, and we're back there again. I don't know how much of a, a lag there actually was. The increase in suicide ideation, drug and alcohol misuse, and what does that mean for the teachers? How are the teachers doing? They're struggling, and they need the help of, our, of your coaching and your training and your support because it's really hard out there, and the administrators are struggling. We need to protect the mental health of the adults if we're gonna help the mental health of the kids. And how many of you have active support programs for teachers' mental health in your school districts, right? It's going on, people are using the multi-tiered approach for that, we'll come back to that. Have you seen the 2023 CDC report on US and teen girls? It's, it's not pretty, but we need to know about it, right? Uh, teen girls are experiencing record high levels of violent stress Sadness and suicide, LGBTQ plus teens continue to face extremely high levels of violence and mental health challenges. If you're not a data person, that number going up is not a good thing, right? That's the teen girls who persistently felt sad or hopeless increased dramatically over the 10 year period of the CDC report. So, you know, we've got, we've got um, a lot of work to do. More than one in four girls reported they seriously considered attempting suicide in 2021, up significantly over the past 10 years, right? Uh, more than one in 10 girls reported they attempted suicide in 2021. And you know, the, it's not just girls, but the, the, those were some highlights from the new report. I mean, suicide has been the leading cause of death in either the, the two or the three slot, over the past 20 years. I can't, we can't even keep track of it because the good news is more people are monitoring it. So when you see that data, it depends who's reporting it in terms of if it's the second leading cause of death or if it's the third leading cause of death. Depends on which grouping. But you know, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot on our hands. You know, it, Schools, they're the primary support for mental health. Okay, But does everybody feel safe at school? You know, for example, our black LGBTQ plus population, they can be terrified, not just in the community, not just to go to a club, but to go to school. That's, pr that's pretty startling, right? So we have some very marginalized populations that we need to pay close attention to, and we need to kind of drill down and make sure that we are moving in the right direction. All right, so, uh, and by the way, here's one of my new heroes is our Surgeon General. He points out our epidemic of um, loneliness. And if you haven't read the piece he wrote, I think it was first in the New York Times on the op-ed page, that might be my link since I'm a New York Times freak, but he talked about his own personal experiences with loneliness, and this epidemic of loneliness is about that connectedness word that Valerie Williams spoke of earlier. That's our primary job before we can use any evidence-based practices, is making sure that every kid feels connected to somebody at school. Every single kid, right? And I'm, it's, thank you. It's, re it's really important to have national leaders like this support and give the background for the work that we do. Now, in the context of that, we know what's going on. <gasps> People are using the safety word and going back to practices that don't work. If you haven't seen this PBS series, and we'll come back to it in a moment, but you know, there are, there are states, and I know there are people sitting in this audience who live in states where they're trying to put legislation in place that allows a teacher to say, this kid's out of here for 10 days because he didn't wear his uniform. I am not exaggerating. That is, you know, uniform violations were actually tagged into the ability to kick a kid out because you don't feel safe. But, you know, we do know that exclusionary discipline is the road to hell for kids. Their lives are pretty much shaped 
by being kicked out of school. And, but it, it, it's not the answer. This, this uh, documentary did a very good job, and another one of my new heroes, a woman I've never met, I don't know if anybody knows her, but Professor Thalia Gonzalez from the UC College of Law in San Francisco. She made a very good point when she said, look, the problem here isn't matching, is that there, people aren't matching safety with healthy. They're doing things under the guise of safety that end up being not healthy. And she talked about it's safe and healthy. We can do both. And she explains why, if you need to have conversations with dialogue with other people and you're struggling to make the point, listen to what she has to say. I'm gonna play a few of her words later as we close out here. But she talks about the data, she shares the data on the disparities and the lifelong impact of kicking kids out of school. And she talks about you know, why people might be going back there. And most importantly, she talks about what we need to do. And she talks about our work. I've never met her. Have you guys met her? She talks about PBIS. She talks about school-wide approaches. She talks about prevention as what we should be doing instead of the policies that are coming up. So she's another one of my new heroes. And equity is a major uh, tenant of the center work. And this is just four of the documents that Kent McIntosh and his team of people like Rhonda Neese and Maria Santiago and Ruthie Pale Simmons and others have been working on so hard. We have lots of resources for you on the center website on equity. And speaking of that, and by the way, Valerie Williams said, the US Department of Education, what were the buckets? Systems, data, and practices. Where did she get that, Renee? I have no idea, because this is the second tattoo of PBIS. First it's the triangle, then it's the circles, and there's Valerie Williams from the U.S. Department of Education who said to us this morning, systems, data, and practices are our three buckets. I'm like, yeah, baby, we're, 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 we're there. But look what's in the middle of that. Equity has to be across everything that we do. And the, I look to the resources on our center and the equity strand at this, you know? So things are hard. It's not an easy context out there. It's not the same context out there, but you know what, you guys, we got this. You got this. We know what to do. We have the structures. We have the framework, right? We, we know what to do here. Speaking of the framework, the new uh, PBIS blueprint is out. Heather, how did I do? I got it in there, okay. And you know, look at, look at the boxes on there, that leadership team in the middle. First of all, where are the superintendents? Matter of fact, I bet we have a few here today. Any superintendents, raise your hand proudly. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being at the table. Where else? Thank you. We have got to have cabinet level leadership in this work, right? But this blueprint might look confusing to some of you. There will be sessions on it. There's even a poster session, I think, on it. I'm not going to go through it all, but one of my new favorite center resources some young woman named Megan Cave, I, I haven't met her, but I've been emailing with her. She wrote this cool little piece, Demystifying the Framework. So check out Megan's piece. If you're like, what does this framework mean? Go read Megan's piece. She's amazing. I've been trying to simplify that for 25 years, and what, did she do it in a week, Robin? She wrote that? I don't know. But it's very, a very good resource for you. And when you look at our public health model, we got this because we're supporting teachers. We're using the three-tiered model to build wellness programs for adults. And people in schools are doing, for all the teachers, how are we doing? Are you okay, right? Checking in with the teachers and building employee assistance programs and helping people access supports is incredibly important. And it, it, the, the medical model, right there for you, applying database decision making to address staff well-being, it's the same thing. How many staff feel connected? Well, I don't know. I guess we better find out. How should we find out? Should we do a survey? Should we do interviews, right? Okay, we're applying the same thinking, the same techniques. How many of, of, your, of the staff feel like they can manage their workload? Well, I guess you could start by asking them, how many of you feel, how many people in here feel like they can manage their workload? Nobody raises their hand, right? Okay, so the point is that you can use the same multi-tiered model to address staff wellness, and we encourage you to do that, right? You know, Andrea Davis used to say, how are the children doing? Remember when Andrea stood up here and said that? 
How are the children doing? And how are the teachers doing? How are the principals doing? How are the superintendents doing? I mean, I, I know somebody who always needs that. How are the special ed directors doing? That's one of the most thankless jobs in the world. I've been one, right? Special ed directors, they get blamed for everything, but they don't have a whole lot of power to change it. They work by influence, right? I love you special ed directors that are out there. So supporting the adults is, is really critically important. We have a lot of resources and we have sessions here at the forum on adult wellness. Uh, I'm really proud of our Midwest team, Amy Flamini and, and Katie, the, the, Katie Pullman, and where's Kimberly Yannick? And Kimberly, they are, they are our, our pioneers on getting staff wellness out there and I'm really proud of them. And their work is here for you. There's a session for you on that. There's another center resource I love, even though it's as supporting kids with disabilities in the classroom, it's the 10 practices that you have to do. And Bob Putnam will tell you, when you coach these, just pick three at a time, or you know, four. Can we do four, Bob? Oh, he says four. You can pick four. But this is what we used to do in the basement. This is what we used to do in the pods, in the separate wings only. And now everybody's learning how to use these practices. And this is how we make school environments effective for all kids, is all the adults know what to do. I have to tell you a little story here. I'm going to apologize to Tim Lewis ahead of time. The CCBD crowd back in the day, they wrote a piece once when I was doing my dissertation. And, well, before I was doing my dissertation, but I read it more when I, and they basically said, about 10 of them signed off on it, teachers can never manage behavior like that in the classroom because it's just too hard. Remember that piece, Tim? Yep. Okay, you know, I said to one of them someday, you're gonna be gone and I'm gonna be here and it's not gonna be that way. And here we are, right? It's not that hard, we can do it. It's just teaching and it's just trans changing the systems around the teachers so they feel supported so everybody knows how to do this and supervision and support and coaching consists for that. So that's one of my great resources, you know. And Dr. Kurt Hatch, who's here, I love Kurt. I love it when he says this, PBIS is not curriculum adoption. It is about, in case you don't know who he is, it is about transforming the systems, right? So, you know, and I, I love, Kurt's work because he's a former principal and a former leader of the principal organization in one of our Northwest states, you know? So he's getting the word out there to principals. You gotta transform the systems. Thank you, Kurt, for that. So when we talk about transforming the systems, remember what Valerie Williams says, mental health and wellness at the core, wellness at the foundation. Mental health isn't a place, it isn't a person. It isn't a place you send kids to. Matter of fact, Susan and I don't even want you to use the word referral, because it sounds like you're handing the kid from one person to the other. Say request for assistance, and bring the clinician to the table with the people who are with the kid every day to figure out what to do. Don't hand off. Wellness is not a place. Mental health is not a person. It's, it's all of us, and it's the foundation and background of our work. So let's talk for a few minutes about PBIS 2.0, okay? Brandy probably didn't want me to say that. You took that out of one of our papers. I saw that, you know? So I thought, I saw that. You took that one out. You edited that out. So I thought, oh, I'll make the subtitle, you know? She, pretty fun. So what is different after 25 years? How are we transforming the system? The main way we're transforming is to include other people at the table to help us bring community and school and family and youth voice to the center of how we make decisions for improving things. That's really critically important and we're, we're kind of co-designing together, right? How many of you in here have clinician attached to your name? Either school psychologist, school social worker, guidance counselor, right? Our clinicians, yeah, they're not here, they're all at schools, right, okay? Our clinicians working with teams in different ways. We have transformed the role of the school psychologist, the school social worker, and the community mental health professional in regards to our work in schools. They're coaching teams 
They're providing expertise so more people who aren't clinicians can teach coping skills and help people with anxiety. And their role changes as we go up the triangle. We have a lot of resources on our webpage about the changing role of the clinician. And we gotta get out of the silos. We don't want co-located mental health people down the hall. We want them integrated into our teams. What does that mean? There's not a meeting for the clinicians to talk about kids, and then the PBIS team meets over here. The clinicians need to be part of the teams, and the dialogue will be different with them there. Okay, and that's another way supporting staff wellness can happen. I already talked about, you know, not, not making referrals and handing kids off, but requests for assistance. The, the critical factor for me, and this is my personal one, is that access is not enough. No matter who delivers the intervention, we should be asking before the intervention starts, how are we going to know if it worked, right? You have to ask that before you start the intervention, not a year later at a meeting, oh, you know, Brian's done really well in this group. He seems to like it. Let's keep him in it. Are you kidding me? That is so unfair. Why do we not know how Brian's behavior has changed and how his life functioned or how he feels better, right? Okay, so the, the transformation of changes in clinician roles is extremely, extremely critical. And when you look at the core features that I mentioned before, the five core features, how do we think and operationalize these 25 years later? I don't have that much time left, but I'm gonna mention a few things. But I am gonna give you a reference to one of my new favorite documents. There's plenty of people in this room who got together in maybe last year and said, you know, we gotta we got bring ourselves together even more. And they got together and they wrote this document and it's fantastic, this collaboration from national experts. I was not a part of it, but there were many people in this room. How many were part of this? Raise your hand. Eric, I know you were. Bob, I know you were. Susan, this is a, it's really helpful because what they do is they take all the core features and explain and how they're different now with a focus on wellness. And so I encourage you, if you want to know about PBIS 2.0, take a look at that document because it really does explain how we're working together differently 25 years later. Later, We have community providers in many states, many districts, many schools sitting at the table in different ways working on school improvement plans. We are looking at community data. We're looking at emergency room visits. We're looking at serious mental health data at the school level to impact what we do in the classroom every day. We are paying attention and involving different voice at the table in a way that we never did before. And we're using evidence-based practices linked across the tiers, right? We're not just going to uh, pull these kids out over here and take this kid to an individualized plan over here. Let me show you how many of you are familiar with the teaching matrix. It's one of the basic tools of PBIS where we put down the one side our expectations about kindness, responsibility, and achieving. Then across the top, we say how we're going to teach those and influence those in every setting. The one I want you to look at is in red. Very smart of me to put it in red, wouldn't you say? Okay. Because you know that one that's in red, that used to only be done with a clinician. And only some kids who were referred and were pulled out were learning coping skills and learning how to manage difficult situations. Now it's part of teaching matrix. How many of you know check in, check out as an intervention? Oh. Lovely, so you know the daily progress report. Do you know that the daily progress report can be layered up and used across all the tiers? So for those of you that don't know about check and check out, certain groups of kids need a little more, that's the yellow part of the triangle tier two, and we give them connections with the adult on intervals, in this one it's blocks, where the teacher checks in with them and gives them positive feedback about being kind, being respectful. But if you have kids who need a little bit more of an intervention and they're in a group to, to practice more how to calm themselves, how to anticipate uh, when they're gonna need more, how to use their, their thinking strategies, you can just put that right on their check-in, check-out sheet and then the teacher goes, oh yeah, 
Katie's in that trauma-informed group, I can ask her per specifically and remind her, now remember, use your words if you need them. So you can use these tools to layer up the interventions and keep things connected for the teachers and let the flow happen. T strategies for trauma, anxiety, and depression 25 years later are naturally embedded in the matrix and in the tools that we use, right? Screening, I mentioned it earlier. What's different? We're looking for strengths, not just problems. We're looking for strengths about how we work with kids and families. We're looking for the narratives, we're looking for the stories, and we're looking for internalizing uh, markers and, and indications as well as externalizing ones. And there's sessions on that. And what about the families? Tom Deshawn, may he rest in peace, taught us so much. And he taught us about ask the families. This was, um, I worked with a, someone in Montana, Carol Ewing, and she adapted it and learned it from our Midwest team, remember Sherry? And she took it back to Montana. And basically in the registration packet for middle schoolers is a form for the family to indicate whether they think their kid's gonna need a check, whether they think their kid's gonna need help transitioning into middle school. So families, there's lots of ways screening has changed over the 25 years, right? Oh, how we measure things. Brian already told us about the TFI 3.0. Uh, I was part of the TFI 2.0, and Kent, that was, what, 10 years ago? It's a lot of hard work to come up with fidelity tools, and they have to be validated, but then you can be confident that when you use them, if you measure correctly, you will, if you move towards, yeah, we teach to the test, do what's on this tool, and you will get better impacts for kids in your school, right? What I'm excited about is mental health is all over the TFI. FI 3.0. Some of us worked really hard to get family voice, youth voice, and wraparound and person-centered planning in 2.0 10 years ago. So now the extension of that is we go even further. So check out the TFI uh, 3.0. And if you want to be part of the validation study, uh, email Jen Freeman or go to Brian. That, they'll, they'll tell you how to do it. Yeah, Jen Freeman. She'll tell you how to do that. So coaching. I want to talk about coaching. And this is a uh, uh, and uh, shout out to uh, Bob Putnam in the Gardner School District. Who's here from Gardner today? Where are you? Yay, thank you, and thank you for letting me share some of your data. So, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about coaching, and I already talked a little bit about Bob's coaching, and first of all, I got to introduce you. There's Mark Pellegrino, one of our superintendents, who's here today, thank you. And you know, Bob loves the, 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 what Mark says. I can't read it from that distance. Positive relationships and rigor for every child in every classroom, every day. Who wants a superintendent that says that? At board meetings, at community meetings, at staff meetings, right? So, you know, and, and if your superintendent's not there yet, call Mark and have him call him. And then, of course, the people at the district level, Amber and Joyce, are critical to that as well. And I'm just going to share a couple of comments about it. But when Bob started coaching Gardner, when he started working with them, he asked them, this is the person-centered stuff, what, what's bothering you, what's important to you? And they were basically chasing ODRs and referrals into special education. Would that be fair to say? And they wanted to, they wanted to really change things. And Bob had them focus on four of those 10 practices. And I got to tell you, there is a fabulous video of how to use instructional, uh, how to coach classroom changes that Kimberly Yannick uh, hosts with Bob Putnam on this. So I can't share much of that, but he actually tells you how he helped them design a coaching system that's appreciated by the teachers at, rather than being a burden to them to help change their practices. And so watch that video if you wanna learn that. I'll just show you the outcomes from it, okay? And they happen pretty quickly because the superintendent was at the table and they did lots of coaching, they prioritized it, and they got the changes. You know, it only works if you do it, you guys, right? The hard part, of course, is you're, you're, I'm like preaching to the choir here, you wouldn't be here if you didn't wanna do it, right? But anyway, they, they re-implemented PBIS. You can see the office discipline referrals going down, but most importantly, decreases in ODRs for students with disabilities. That's an indicator of the health of your system for all kids. When your kids with disabilities are doing well in the general education classroom, 
that's an indication of how all the kids are doing. And this, this, they exceeded their goals for reducing special ed referrals. This was classroom-based tier one in the beginning. And then they moved on to tier two and tier three. Look at that, improved teacher retention. Hello, that's important, right, okay? And then, of course, they measured the fidelity. When the fidelity goes up with a validated tool, the, the outcomes go up as well. The positive outcomes go up as the fidelity goes up, so stay the course. What I love about the Gardner story is they already got to tier three, and they're already, through coaching, seeing an impact on tier three. So the, 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 the the one on the left there did not get the intensified coaching support around their tier three plans. When the coaching support was added to make sure people knew what they were doing and were comfortable with what they were doing, the outcomes for the kids changed. Tier one, tier two, tier three. Stay the course with the coaching. This, this is Bob and my favorite slide because in, in the red are the kids who did, didn't do any better with their tier three plans. And in the coaching group, there's no red there. Everybody had either stayed the same, but the green is got better. So if you provide the act of coaching all the way through the tiers, you'll actually gain instructional time because people are spending less time going to the office, right? So we're really um, excited about the tier three impact. And here is the, um, sorry, the, I went too fast. There's, the, Bob wrote a guide with some other people on tier three, and I, I suggest that you read it. So let's close out here. I want you to think about hope, right? Hope's an optimistic state of mind. Can we have an optimistic state of mind? We have to. Did you hear Renee? She's in charge here, man. She said, she said we have to. So we can move onward with hope and confidence. I got some heroes who, who have helped me move forward with optimism and hope. How about icons? who say my mental health is important and I gotta fix it, right? H how about this article that says social emotional learning persists despite political backlash, right? Okay, and for, I want you to listen just for a minute to what Thalia Gonzalez says, if I can make her talk. Brian says wait, hit it again. That's the academic, that's the behavioral, and that's the social emotional. Right? That's the evidence-based, trauma-informed, high-quality core curriculum. So what does that mean? Positive behavioral interventions have long-standing records um, of having positive outcomes. Social-emotional learning, all in legislation as well. Restorative justice, all in legislation. So instead of the laws that we're talking about, we should be scaffolding up those and then also coupling those with investments in mental health services. Because when you have multi-tiered system interventions, you flip the script you increase graduation rates, right? You increase academic achievement, you increase test scores, you increase grade completion, you engage students, they're less truant, they're coming to school and you have positive climates. And that's when children thrive and that's when they Right? That was on the PBS special. You know, we can go forward with hope and confidence when we have national leaders who are supporting our work, when we have people that aren't even connected with our center talking about our work, you know, we need to make sure, just in closing, the foundation, the connectedness, making sure every kid has a person at school. We need to make sure that we're not just hiring more staff, but we're actually changing the system that the staff are working in, right? Transforming the systems. And you know, as you do the work, embrace our human connection. I love this quote. If you could only sense how important you are to the lives of those you meet, how important you can be to the people you may never even dream of, there is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with every person. You know who said that? Mr. Rogers, okay, okay. And, and let me close with, Susan and I, are, are, we, we talk about this quote a lot when we're feeling like we need some hope. Do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. So thank you, everybody. Have a great conference. <laughs>